long have we known each other? Maybe almost 30 years. And I've been waiting for this day for you to be driving <laughs> me around. I always knew Show you'd be driving you me around. <laughs> This week, I don't have Yolanda with me. Watch that car, watch that jogger. <laughs> but I've got my longtime friend, Detective Alan Brown, to help us look into one of the most horrific murders we've ever seen. So we're talking about a nine-year-old case? Nine years, yeah. Everybody in the town knows about it. His family's well known here. We're in Paducah, Kentucky, to look into the 2006 murder of 81-year-old Dr. Frank Shimwell, the town's beloved doctor. On the afternoon of July 24th, Frank's wife Penny got home to find the house on fire with Frank still inside. 911, where's your emergency? There's a, there's, I can't get in the house and my husband. It's 4,200 bucks for laying. It's a fire and it's, I can't get in there too. And... When the fire department showed up, they found Dr. Shimwell's body on the floor burned beyond recognition. The autopsy revealed soot in his lungs, which means that he literally burned alive. I can't think of a more horrible way to die. I can't even imagine. So the first uphill battle with this scene, obviously, is fire. Mm -hmm. Arson cases are hard to investigate because any physical evidence you might have had literally has gone up in smoke. It's a big reason this case is still unsolved. The death of Dr. Frank Shimwell is surrounded by questions. He'll be sadly missed by his family and many, many friends. This is the kind of case that's all about trying to find the proper witnesses, yeah, which is what we have to do this week. It seems like everybody in this whole town knew and loved Dr. Shimwell. Hopefully they can help us piece together what happened and we can figure out whoever it was that committed this cold-hearted evil act. It has been 16 years and still no answer. Please consider her killing a cold case. Years later, the case is still unsolved. There are so many cold cases out there just waiting to be solved. The crime scene ultimately tells the story of the murder. We want to bring justice to these victims. You get that for you, man. <laughs> Morning. Hi. Hi. Kelly? Brian Laird. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Troy Turner. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hey, Chief Martin Hill. Chief Alan Brown. Yeah, nice, nice to meet you, nice to meet you Alan. Thank Good you very morning. much for inviting us. You're welcome. Yeah, we appreciate you coming to Kentucky and see what we can get worked out on this case. When Dr. Shimwell was murdered, it had a pretty big impact just because he was a local physician and the fact that he's 81 years old. I think that everybody within the community, especially the people that knew Dr. Shimwell, want some closure to this case. So we got a picture here of Dr. Frank Shimwell, and here he is with whom? That's him with his first wife, Mary. Frank's wife, Mary, died of cancer in 2002. Within weeks, Frank started seeing his next door neighbor, Penny Baird, and he married her shortly thereafter. So the case happens, you're here at the department, and tell us how it starts. It happened on July 24th, 2006 a little after 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Our 911 center received a call from a woman saying that a uh, house was on fire and that uh, her husband was inside and she couldn't get to it. The firemen make it to the kitchen area. They recognize that there's a, a body laying on the floor. And what they notice immediately is that there are things piled on top of the body. So that was really the first clue that it, this isn't something that is accidental. They contacted a detective with the Kentucky State Police. He believed that an accelerant was used and there was um, soot in his lungs, um, so he was alive. The person that would do this to an 81-year-old feeble man who had to use a wheelchair to get around and then couldn't even get up on his own is um, about the worst there is, about as evil as you can get. They were able to get a forensic anthropologist and she can definitively say that Dr. Shemwell had been struck in the head with something. Dr. Shimwell suffered separate blows to his head, which meant that someone knocked him upside of the head, down onto the floor most likely, and then put things on top of him to set him on fire like he was a bonfire. I can't imagine how painful that was of a way to die. So guys, let's start with Penny Baird, who's one of our suspects. She's his wife. She's his wife and is half his age. She's 40 and he's 81. She's married to him nine months after his wife's death. Can we say at the time she married Dr. Shimwell, 
her financial situation was a lot different than his. Definitely, right? yes. And that's even noted in the details of the uh, prenuptial. She has nothing. Dr. Shimwell was well off and had Penny sign a prenup before they got married to keep their assets separate. But after the wedding, Penny worked real hard to get control of his money. She gets him down there and changes the trustees from his daughters to her. Then she revises Will and puts her in charge of everything. Any kind of prior criminal history? Nothing that was violent, but she has had several run-ins with the police. Before she married Frank, Penny had spent some time in jail for shoplifting. And before Frank's death, she was looking at going to prison for violating her probation. She apparently knows she's going to jail in August. We're not sure if any of this is connected with the murder, but it might suggest what kind of woman we're dealing with. OK, so let's put Chris Baird up here. Penny's son. son. How old was he back then? 18, 19. So if mom gets the money, he stands to benefit. Right. On the day of the murder, police brought Chris down to the station for questioning. Chris was evasive in answering the questions about where he'd been just hours earlier. The last time you were over at uh, Mr. Shimmel's house? Like yesterday. You didn't see him at all today? Did you go over no. to the house today? No. No, not that He wouldn't take a polygraph without talking to his mom. And what happens when he takes the polygraph? It was inconclusive. Were you at Dr. Shimwell's house any time before the fire started? No. Polygraphs are not a perfect science, and they are not admissible in court. But an inconclusive result will always make you wonder if Chris is maybe hiding something. OK. All right. Can do Tim? Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. It's Penny's lover. Yep. At the time of Frank's murder, Penny was having a not very secret affair with a man named Tim Jones. I did add up here sex the morning of. He didn't say. We had sex, but he insinuated. Not hiding their relationship. No. And he's his only alibi witness. He says, after she leaves, I'm home, watch Dr. Phil, or take a nap. Right. And I just happened to ease over. According to Tim, on the day of the murder, he decided to stop by Penny's house, and when he got near, the fire department trucks were already blocking his way. Not only is his story strange, but since he says he was alone, he has no one to corroborate it and a pretty good motive to kill Frank if he wanted Penny all to himself. A key thing, too, is that Tim had these little, it's like these little racing cars that take nitromethane, which is a fast-burning liquid. Well, Penny claims in one of her statements that an empty bottle of it rolled out from underneath the seat of his truck or something like right. that. She's talking about um, Tim having been the one who killed Dr. Shimwell. When questioned by police, Penny told them that Tim had admitted he killed her husband. I said, I said to him, well, I think you killed Frank. And he said, I did. And what are you going to do about it? I'll take you down with me. And we don't have him accusing her back when he hears that she's throwing him under the bus. No. Nothing. Nothing. Well, that's a pretty good start for the board. We have three suspects with potentially intersecting motives. The question is, did any of them work independently or together to kill Dr. Shemwell? We are going to meet Dr. Shemwell's grown children today. Hi. Hi. Catherine, Hi. Carolyn, and also Alan. Why don't y'all tell us about your dad? He was very smart. He had such a funny sense of humor and just, you know, a real dry way of saying things. He loved nature. On Sundays, he would always take us for picnics. He was incredibly strong. We'd go on a hike. We would get too tired to continue. And he'd scoop one up with one arm, and he was to take off. And his marriage with y'all's mom? They had fun together. I mean, he expressed so much distress you know, during the time Mom was dying and afterwards about being left alone. He just, he hated that. Well, when was it that y'all first realized that your dad was even considering dating Penny? I'll tell you when I first knew. Our, okay. our mother was in the hospital and she was dying. And I asked Daddy, I'm going to get some dinner, you know, would you like something? And he said, oh, don't worry about that. Penny's brought a casserole over and I have plenty of food. She was bringing him food already, you know, before our mother was even dead. And there was never a time where we all went to confront her or individually headed out with her or anything? Oh, yeah, we did. <laughs> I was going to say, how could you, I mean, we did. how could you not? I don't 
Oh, she just had this gloating look on her face, like she knew it wasn't going to matter what I said, that she had this. Mm -hmm. I think that's every child's nightmare for their parent. If they marry a gold digger wife number two or three, you don't like it. And you want to tell your dad, no, you can't marry her, but you can't. You can't stop them. Thank you. You have to hug me. I will. But a gold digger is not necessarily a murderer. And I can't help but think that if Frank is getting companionship and care from Penny in return for letting her spend his money, then maybe Penny didn't have a motive to kill Frank after all. Think about how old that house is. Dr. Schindler was born there and was raised there, and then he had his kids and he raised them there. Yeah. We're on our way to the house where Dr. Frank Schimwell was bludgeoned and burned to death in 2006. Oh my God, look at that place. It's a nice house. Frank's wife Penny inherited most of the assets after he died, but his children inherited the house, which they sold soon afterwards. Morning, guys. Chief. Fire Chief Steve Kyle was one of the initial responders. Okay, let's go inside and tell us what all you saw. And today he's trying to help us figure out what happened. So when you got here that day, Chief, and you came in the kitchen, what all did you see? It was immediately evident that this was the room of origin. This room had the most burn damage. Dr. Shimmel was in the fetal position with his head right where the oven and table came together. We know Dr. Shimwell was found on the floor with two fractures to his skull and a filing cabinet resting on top of his body. The question here is, how did he end up like that? OK, so I'm Dr. Shimwell, and I'm sitting here watching my TV. First thing you think the murderer does is what? We know there were two blows to the head. So if you take blow number one and hit. OK, so he's down here on the ground. All right, at some point, there's a second blow delivered. And you take this filing cabinet, and you throw it on top of me, and then the books are piled on top. And, and he's not dead, he's alive. He, he is, he's still alive. Wow. Lying there on that cold floor with that chair or filing cabinet put on top of me. That's pretty cold. I realized you can't get it off of you, you can't move, and you can't stop it from happening. You're just on the floor defenseless. And that filing cabinet was where he kept all of his books. Two of our suspects, Tim Jones and Chris Baird, were both strong men. But the doctor's wife, Penny, was only 5'4 and weighed less than 100 pounds. I'm wondering if she would even be able to lift a heavy filing cabinet. How heavy is that? If it didn't have much in it, it wouldn't be that heavy. And that filing cabinet was directly in front of him, like a small two-drawer filing cabinet. I mean, think about it. If you have Penny, who's 80 pounds, bringing it from a whole other room all the way in here, but if it's in the kitchen, you just have to turn it over. The filing cabinet was much smaller than I thought it would be, but now that we know how close it sat to where the murder happened, I don't think we can rule Penny out at all. Once his body was removed from the scene, we found that the fire had burned all the way through the floor in an area near his head and where it actually went through to the basement. What does that mean? That there was a flammable liquid there that could make that kind of burn. Okay. Often in a fire, the victim's body will protect the floor from burning. But in this crime, an unknown accelerant was poured on the victim's head and spilled onto the floor. So when the fire was lit, not only did it burn through the victim, but it also burned completely through the hardwood floor. We know Penny told detectives her boyfriend, Tim Jones, had an empty fuel canister in his truck, and police recovered accelerants from his house. But since the accelerant in this fire is unknown, we can't determine if it was Tim's fuel that started it. This is pretty much what it looked like. Actually added on to the back of the home. But what it used to be was a gravel driveway that went all the way behind the house. So somebody could park a car behind and nobody would see it. Right. Back when this murder occurred, someone could have easily hidden a car behind Frank's house. So any of our suspects could have committed this crime practically undetected. That house back then was probably one of the nicer houses in Paducah. Yeah. And the fact that someone was murdered there, God, it's so sad. We have three suspects, and they all knew each other, so there might be more than one of them involved. We need to look at their alibis to see which of them had the opportunity to kill Frank. Up here are the things that we think we know for sure. We know that Penny had a really busy morning because she was running errands all over town. I'm at the post office. I'm late. Thomas Furniture sometime. I took back a bag and went to Burning Hoses, and my bracelet broke again. It's almost like she was trying to be seen. 
And we know that Chris was also busy running errands around town. Chris gets up that morning at 11, goes to Salvation Army, goes to McDonald's. What time did, did you go to Salvation Army? Probably, probably took like an hour, I guess, from whenever I woke up. Tim has the weakest alibi because he says he worked early morning, had sex with Penny mid-morning, and then he took a nap. Then I took a nap, smoked a cigarette, and got a shower. Watched the first part of Dr. Field. I mean, he's his own alibi. We're having a hard time making sense of the day, and that's when I realized that we're missing a really big piece of the puzzle. I had one big case where I learned the most I've ever learned about arson. The girl gets raped. She set on fire on the couch. It was about 1 in the morning. The next day at 11 o'clock, there is no smoke coming out of any windows. There's nothing in flames. There's nothing that you can tell from the outside of the house. That many hours later, they go in the house, smoke is everywhere, but she's dead. But the point is that with a fire, you never know how long it's going to take with the smoke and the flames and all that. So all this up there where we're trying to figure out, I don't think we ever know. It's just so variable. Right. Fires can smolder, so our fire could have been lit hours before the firemen ever arrived. And because we can't say when the murder occurred, we also can't rule out any of our suspects. We're going to have to solve this case another way. We are in Paducah, Kentucky, investigating the 2006 murder of 81-year-old Dr. Frank Shemwell. We need to focus on motive, and at first glance, it seems like out of our three suspects, no one had more of a motive than Frank's wife, Penny. Why would Penny marry him? Honey, he's a, it's not a sexual relationship. I thought like anybody else to see somebody young married old man, it's all about money, I figured. She's manipulated by money. I mean, that's all her concern was. She got a house, and then there was a pool, and then remodeling, and uh, maybe some plastic surgery. Well, obviously, when you're a man that has a lot of money, he's your sugar daddy, but I think she took pretty good care of him, really, but probably more like a nurse would. Have Instead of a husband wife, OK. Penny definitely enjoyed her newfound fortune when she married Frank. But if Frank was agreeing to that and Penny cared for him, then why would she kill him? We're going to go try to track down Brenda. Brenda Thompson is a home health aide who helped Penny take care of Frank since he was basically housebound. She should have first-hand knowledge of their relationship. I fell in love with him because, you know, he's just such a good guy, and I just couldn't believe somebody did that. As your professional opinion, was he being taken care of like he should have been taken care of? No, sir. Oh, it was terrible. The house is real dirty, and Dr. Shinwell was dirty. I don't know when was the last time she... You know, she gave him a bath or nothing. Is there anything that she wanted done? Uh -uh. She just called to check on him, and then, when, you know, in the background, you could hear music, like he's at a bar or something, you know. This is interesting because it seems Penny's not upholding her end of the bargain in taking care of Frank. Is there anything else that you can remember? I'm going to see 06. Yeah. My son at that time, he had a business. Okay. And she asked me if my son could get her son a job because he didn't have a job. She said, well, he don't have no money. Even though she wasn't taking care of Frank, Penny had access to his money. Chris, on the other hand, was broke, so he could have been trying to hasten an inheritance. Hello? I was trying to reach Michael Buckley. Yes, sir. Chris claims that on the day of the murder, Penny called him about the fire and he ran over there to help. Michael Butley was a neighbor who witnessed the fire. Maybe he witnessed Chris's behavior as well. Tell me about that day. I just remember mowing the lawn and a guy in a white, it was a white van. When you seen the van, where were you at? It was in the front yard mowing. Man, I really appreciate you talking with us today. Have a nice day. All right, you too. Have a good afternoon. So there's two houses on that block. Okay. Dr. Schimmel's house, the front door's right here, and okay. this house sits right here. So he's looking at the front he's, yard. He's looking at it. Okay. Michael saw a white van parked in front of Frank's house earlier that day. We know that Chris Bear drove a white van back then, but according to Chris, he never stopped at the house earlier that day. Were you at Dr. Schimmel's house any time before the fire started? No. Well, obviously, there are a lot of white vans in right. the world, but I'm wondering whether or not Chris is confused or not not being straight about being there at all right. that day. We need to talk to Chris to get to the bottom of this. 
think Chris will talk to us? Who knows? After Frank's murder, Chris actually changed his last name, but we've tracked him down to living about an hour away. It's time for us to get some answers. Ooh, two cars at home. Somebody's walking out the door right now. Hello. Hi, Chris. My name's Troy Turner. I'm a detective with Paducah Police. That's nice me. to meet you. I'd just like to talk to you for a few minutes. No problem. Kind of go back to that day. We were having just a completely normal day, and then, you know, and then freaking, you know, it's actually almost house on fire. And I remember, you know, I, I was wanting to go in there after I seen, like, you know, his house is, like, filling up with black smoke. I See, that's the part I remember really good is just me trying to go in there. And I tried to make it in there as much as I could. I don't know. No one could survive that. It made even, you know, the seconds I was in there and realized, you know, I had to turn back. It was horrible. It was a horrible day. The worst day of my life. There was a possibly a van that, that stopped by there. Do you remember if you had stopped by Frank's? You know, to my 100% recollection of everything, how everything happened, we did not go by there. Okay. Like for anything. That morning, you know, for anything. Chris is still denying that he ever went to Frank's house in the hours before the murder. I'm wondering if Frank's neighbor is just confused or if Chris has something to hide. Why'd you change your last name, Chris? Because I'm, I'm embarrassed. I'm still embarrassed to this day about this whole situation. Just a memory of just being thought of as a murderer. Like, I can't believe, you know, I even ever was thought of like that. Does she ever? ever knew me outside, you know? Like, I'm super happy, you know, and I've always been, you know, but that definitely did put a damper on who I was, you know, at that time. Because that's something you just, you know, obviously you just don't do. You just don't do that in life. Though Chris sounds completely innocent, we're still not sure what to think. Chris's wife, Amanda, is here, and she was with Chris on the day of Frank's death. We need to see if her story matches his. Do you remember that day? Do you remember what was going on? It's been so long. We're talking to our suspect, Chris Baird's wife, Amanda, to try and figure out whether or not Chris was involved in Frank Shimwell's murder back in 2006. Do you mind to just tell me what you can remember? I mean, me and Chris, we were always over there helping him out. That's why one of the things that's hurt us so bad is because we love that man so much. And for it to ever be thought that we ever had any part of anything that happened to him, it's just life crushing for us. Like, y'all don't understand. This is like really just messed our entire lives up. We still have the van to this day, so anybody can run tests on it because they want to say that the van was there that day. We're not getting rid of the van because of that. You know okay. what I'm saying? Like In the years since the murder, Chris and Amanda have heard that Frank's neighbor may have seen Chris's white van that day. But they didn't get rid of the van. They kept it. There's nothing that we could have ever done to hurt that man. I didn't know Dr. Shimwell, but... He was a good man. He, you know, n no one deserves that. He was that. so happy the day I told him I married Chris. All right, well, thank you. And that was interesting. Moving away, keeping the van. Wow. Both Chris and Amanda seem to have been truly affected by Frank's murder. It's time for us to make a decision about Chris. He was righteously upset the very day of the fire, trying to save Frank's life. It was a horrible day. The worst day of my life. Chris's inconclusive polygraph. Were you at Dr. Shimmel's house any time before the fire started? No. Now seems more likely because he was a frightened teenager than because he was a killer. And while it is still unclear whether or not Chris's van was truly at the crime scene that day, you have to wonder if Frank's killer could have easily hidden the vehicle behind the house. Somebody could park a car behind and nobody would see it. Right. Would Chris have parked his van right out front to be seen by the neighbor? Because they want to say that the van was there that day. We're not getting rid of the van because of that. Chris has even kept that van all these years just in case the police ever wanted to examine it. I can't think of any time I've had a similar case like that where somebody hung on something that long because they're worried. What you can deny with Chris is that even after all these years, he hopped in the car with us immediately. He never hesitated or avoided a single topic. He changed his name. He moved away. The effect that this has had on him is understandable, and his actions are completely consistent with an innocent man. I think you can mark Chris off the list. All right, so Chris comes off the board. 
we are now down to two suspects and we need to try and figure out whether or not either of them or both of them is responsible for killing our good doctor. We need to learn more about Tim Jones. So we're hoping to catch Marcus and Jamie here. That would be nice. Frank Shimwell's grandson, Marcus Floyd, used to work with Tim. Hopefully he can tell us whether or not Tim's affair with Penny could have driven him to murder. Tell me about Tim. He's he just a slimy dude, man, he really is. Because him and Penny were, were screwing at the time, and, you know, he was he was reaping the benefits of the money. You know what I mean? They were they were going out getting boats and running around. They were just, they were up to all kinds of crap together in two words, and this whole thing went down, and we ain't spoke since. Now that we know Penny was sharing Frank's money with Tim, it gives Tim all the more motive to want Frank dead. Okay. Good luck. All right. We want to talk to Marcus's wife, Janie. Janie, I appreciate it. Who is also, coincidentally, Penny's daughter. Penny is your mother, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, do you and her have a good relationship now, or what kind of relationship do you have? I mean, I wouldn't say we have a real good relationship. Okay. I didn't talk to her for about eight years, so. Okay, so you haven't had much contact with her since the, since the murder. Who do you think knocked Frank upside the head and set him on fire? Well, I mean, I'd always been real suspicious about Tim anyway. And just the way he kind of showed up over at Frank's afterwards and just, I mean, I always, Tim's just always real suspicious kind of character anyway. I appreciate you talking to me. All right. Tim Jones has a bad reputation, pretty good motive, and his story can't be corroborated by anybody. Let's call him. If we're gonna clear up Tim's involvement in Frank's murder, we're gonna need to talk to him face to face. Hey, is this Tim? Yeah. Hey, Tim, this is Brian Laird with the police department. I've been working on this old Shimwell case. I was hoping that maybe you could just help me maybe get a better understanding of things. I'm good, I can. There's Timothy. Hey, Tim. Not too bad of a day to get to work, huh? You still see Penny any? Nope, I don't care to see her. <laughs> Why is that? Shit, that bitch is trouble. Yes, I'm waiting on you right now. <laughs> Who is this? Buddy of mine. Hello? Uh, I'm Eddie Nelson. I would prefer him not to even catch these characters. Apparently, when Tim agreed to meet with us, he also called a lawyer who wants to sit in on the meeting. Eddie Brian Laird. I can't say how this is going to affect our interview, but given my experience with lawyers, I don't have a good feeling about it. We're talking to our suspect, Tim Jones, and his lawyer, or at least we're trying to. I don't think y'all went the right way. Okay. I think y'all went, had your blinders on, so I don't think they'll ever find out what happened. What was your understanding, I guess, back then, of what, what direction the, the police were headed with that? Penny. There was a, a couple of times where the focus had shifted to you. Yeah. Did, I mean, well, of it, course. Um, you know, the, the stuff that Penny was saying, um, she basically said that you did it. Did you know that she had said that? I won't stop. I won't stop. I won't stop. I won't stop. Okay. We had just started the interview with Tim Jones, and his lawyer calls time out and wants to chat with him without us in the room. I got a bad feeling about this. You want him to say, I didn't kill Dr. Sumo again. He didn't say that. But I just don't know enough to, to go forward with this right now. OK. We're just trying to figure out who killed an 81-year-old man and set him on fire. That's it. Oh, Tim, he's a cocky one. Yep, always has been. So it doesn't really help us resolve anything one way or the other, what to do with Tim. Yeah. It's frustrating. With Tim shutting us down, we can't eliminate the notion that he might know something, but we can't force him to talk to us. So now we need to focus on Penny. Bill? This is Kelly. Hi. How are you? No nice to meet you. 
One of the most damning pieces of evidence in any investigation is when a suspect changes their story. How are you doing, sir? So we want to find out what all stories Penny has been telling about what happened to Frank. I've had some good luck using reporters. In 39 years as a reporter, I never saw a case that took so many twists and turns. There had to be a couple of times where you hang up the phone going, geez, I can't believe she said that. Yeah, uh, Shemmel's first thought, her husband's clothes caught fire from a candle. Right after the fire. Penny said Frank burns a lot of candles and he caught his arm on fire last week. So that's the beginning of her story. Right. And so her, her point by saying that you think is what? That oh, it was just a big accident. And then she said that uh, she no longer believed that her husband's death was an accident. So now we got a brand new story. Yeah. She kind of gave me the notion of she didn't do it, but she think somebody did it. And this is a July 22, 2007 story. Shimwell returned to her original belief that her husband's death was an accident. And she talked about she didn't know the cause of death, uh, came home and there were flames in the kitchen. It was almost out when they, the firefighters, finally got there. She made a statement to me that she was with her husband and that he spilled alcohol on himself and then his sleeve caught on fire by a burner and he died due to the fire. She was telling you that she's in the house when this happened. To me, that's an admission that she was there. At the time I... of the fire. Yeah. Penny claimed the fire was a candle accident, and then she said it wasn't an accident, that somebody else did it. She said she came home and found the fire, and then she said she was actually in the house when the fire started. Her stories are crazy. They're all over the place. But the question remains, if Frank is giving Penny everything she wanted, why would she want to kill him? We know that while Frank was initially reluctant, Penny eventually convinced him to sign many of his assets over to her. You can set up, Frank. When you examine the financial documents, the same notary witnessed many of them. A woman named Denise Culp, who worked for the drugstore that was owned by Penny's friend. If she saw Penny and Frank discussing the money, she might know if those conversations ever got ugly. The first time I dealt with her, she came in and said she was needing a notary and said she had Mr. Schimmel. I went out to the car and Mr. Schimmel was out there and from that, that was the only time I ever saw him. From that point on, she came in without him and just wanted me to notarize his signature. She'd bring things in already signed, of which I know is wrong. <laughs> Believe you me, I have changed my tactics. Penny had an understanding with the drugstore and was always trusted when she asked to get things notarized. Denise was carrying on with this tradition, but was doing so with some pretty important documents. Okay, so this is a post-nuptial agreement where it explains that she gets everything, okay? Frank Schimmel's signature is on here, what appears to be his signature, and you didn't see him sign this? No, I did not. Okay. But that's your... your... That is mine. Okay. I wish I could say it wasn't. <laughs> Would you normally sign this? I mean, because this seems kind of odd. Not for anyone else. But maybe for yeah. her? Only because of the relationship. With the with, with the drugstore. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ms. Culp, I appreciate you being honest. It might have been an error in judgment, but it clarifies things for us. Denise notarized documents that ensured Frank's money and assets would go to Penny. Thank you, Ms. Culp including their post-nuptial agreement without ever seeing Frank sign his name. On July 10th, okay. you know, we've got those documents where she was creating the post-nuptial. Since our meeting with the notary has called all of our financial documents into question, we're going back over the files. Tell me the exact quote on the note. It says, I, Frank A. Shimwell, reject the postnuptial property agreement. We have evidence signed by Frank proving that he had become aware that Penny had drafted a postnuptial agreement, signing his assets over to her. I do not want my personal property and all my money to go to my wife, Penny Baird Shimwell, when I die. A postnup that he did not agree with and was actively disputing just 14 days before his murder. Signed Frank A. Shimwell. That's huge. You gotta wonder if, especially because she knew she was going back to prison, Penny realized that her days of taking advantage of Frank were nearing an end. Have we hit all the high point manipulation yeah. of what Penny did? Yes. If she confesses, I'll buy drinks and dinner. <laughs> 
Paducah PD drove by Penny's house and observed that she'd gone to a local craft store. So we're headed there now to catch her off guard. We're just going to catch her when she comes out. All right. Yeah, I'm just going to take my coat off. Oh, man. How are you in Hobby Lobby this long? Oh, Penny's uh, very crafty now. She's making me like her even less. I didn't think that was possible. Damn, there she is. Yep, she got her a new hip. Oh, got her a table, too. Really? Yeah. Let's do it. Hey, Penny, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Good. You remember me? No. No? Okay. My name is Brian Laird. I work with the police department. Uh -huh. Hey, man, you shop for a long time. Okay. Did you get some good things? Okay. Um, I started working on um, Dr. Schimmel's case a couple years ago. So you won't speak with me about it at all? We were just trying to clarify a couple of things that you were talking about with Tim. I mean, you, you got five seconds to talk to me. Okay. There was a time where I think you gave some details about some things Tim had told you. Uh -huh. That he had actually done it. Well, this is why I came. They put me on a lot of medication, and I can just be real honest and tell you, I dreamed that he told me that. I don't know. I don't know if it was a dream or if it was real. If that was a dream, it was a pretty, uh, yeah, I guess, a real. pretty vivid dream. I, I mean, I felt like it was really real. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I don't. I just don't know, y'all. I mean, I don't know what to say. Yeah. This is the first time Penny has ever said her accusation about Tim committing the murder was a dream. Unbelievable. I know that my hands are clear, my heart's clear. I didn't hurt Frank. I did everything in my power to save Frank that day. You have some cases in your career where I call them yappers. You have some defendants that are just going to yap. They're going to talk no matter who they're talking to. And Penny Baird would be in the top five. Every time she opens her mouth, she tells a new version of the story. OK, that was worth waiting on her to come out. It was awful sweet of you to help her put those things in the car. I'm doing many a thing to get someone Absolutely. to talk. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Who dresses you, man? <laughs> Penny's newest story is that when Tim confessed to her he killed Frank, it was all a dream. We need to take a hard look at Tim Jones and what we have against him. What do y'all want to do with Tim? We're going to have a hard time completely Xing him off. When he gets a lawyer and won't talk to you at the end of the story, there's not a lot you can do with it. We don't have any credible evidence to show that Tim was involved in the murder of Frank. But there is no doubt in any of our minds that we've got a circumstantial evidence case against Penny. You have all these financial documents and how she planned the whole getting married and the will and the post -nup. It seems clear that she married Dr. Shinwell for his money, not for love. The house is real dirty and Dr. Shinwell was dirty. Penny not only wanted Frank's money, she may have gone behind his back to get it. She came in without it and just wanted me to notarize his signature. In the weeks before the murder, you got to wonder if Penny realized her days of taking advantage of Frank were numbered, especially since she was headed back to prison and she had a lot to take care of before she left. I, Frank A. Shimwell, reject the postnuptial property agreement. And Penny has told inconsistent stories about Frank's murder for the past nine years. She was there. At the time I... of the fire. And her latest version, oh my God, what a doozy. I don't know if it was a dream or if it was real. Look at this, this is fantastic. I think it's a pretty strong case. Go take it to your Commonwealth attorney. Go take it to him, let us know what happens. All right. We're gonna go meet Carolyn and Alan, Frank's daughter and son again, but Catherine can't come. This morning, Brian went to present the case to the Commonwealth attorney. Hi, Carolyn. And we're meeting with Dr. Shimwell's family to let them know what he found out. 
So I briefly met with Raymond McGee. He's an assistant Commonwealth attorney. And we had a meeting scheduled with Dan, but he had a family emergency. He, he wasn't able to attend. But Raymond McGee thought everything looked good, but, you know, we need to meet with Dan. Okay. It's all up to Dan Bowes and his people now. We feel good. It's, it's a good case. How are y'all doing with all this, Alan, Carolyn? Well, it's been quite an experience. It's been kind of hard to relive it all, and there's not been any closure for us because there's not been any justice for Dad. Well, you've been patient for nine years. Right. Try to wait one more week and then let Brian call you and tell you how that meeting goes. We want to finally bring peace to Frank and his children. Hang in there. A little bit longer. A little bit longer. It's time for the people of Paducah who followed this case for years, as well as Dr. Shimwell's family, to finally get the answers and the justice they all deserve. How long have we known each other? Maybe almost 30 years? And I've been waiting for this day for you to be driving me around. I always knew Chauffeur you would be driving you me around. around. <laughs> this week, I don't have Yolanda with me. Watch that car. Watch that jogger. <laughs> but I've got my longtime friend, Detective Alan Brown, to help us look into one of the most horrific murders we've ever seen. So we're talking about a nine-year-old case? Nine years, yeah. Everybody in the town knows about it. His family's well known here. We're in Paducah, Kentucky, to look into the 2006 murder of 81-year-old Dr. Frank Shimwell, the town's beloved doctor. On the afternoon of July 24th, Frank's wife, Penny, got home to find the house on fire with Frank still inside. 911, where's your emergency? There's a, there's, I can't get in the house, and my husband, it's 4,200 bucks for land. It's a fire, and it's, I can't get in there, too. And... When the fire department showed up, they found Dr. Shimwell's body on the floor, burned beyond recognition. The autopsy revealed soot in his lungs, which means that he literally burned alive. I can't think of a more horrible way to die. I can't even imagine. So the first uphill battle with this scene, obviously, is fire. Mm -hmm. Arson cases are hard to investigate because any physical evidence you might have had literally has gone up in smoke. It's a big reason this case is still unsolved. The death of Dr. Frank Shimwell is surrounded by questions. He'll be sadly missed by his family and many, many friends. This is the kind of case that's all about trying to find the proper witnesses, yeah, which is what we have to do this week. It seems like everybody in this whole town knew and loved Dr. Shimwell. Hopefully they can help us piece together what happened and we can figure out whoever it was that committed this cold-hearted evil act. It has been 16 years and still no at least consider her killing a cold case. Years later, the case is still unsolved. There are so many cold cases out there just waiting to be solved. The crime scene ultimately tells the story of the murder. We want to bring justice to these victims. You get that for you, man. <laughs> Morning. Hi. Hi. Kelly? Brian Laird. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Troy Turner. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hey, Chief Martin Hill. Chief Alan Brown. Yeah, nice, nice to meet you, meet you Alan. Thank Good you morning. very much for inviting us. You're welcome. Yeah, we appreciate you coming to Kentucky and see what we can get you worked out on this case. When Dr. Shimwell was murdered, it had a pretty big impact just because he was a local physician and the fact that he's 81 years old. I think that everybody within the community, especially the people that knew Dr. Shimwell, want some closure to this case. So we got a picture here of Dr. Frank Shimwell, and here he is with whom? That's him with his first wife, Mary. Frank's wife, Mary, died of cancer in 2002. Within weeks, Frank started seeing his next door neighbor, Penny Baird, and he married her shortly thereafter. So the case happened. You're here at the department, and tell us how it starts. It happened on July 24th, 2006 a little after two o'clock in the afternoon. Our 911 center received a call from a woman saying that a house was on fire and that uh, her husband was inside and she couldn't get to it. The firemen make it to the kitchen area. They recognize that there's a, a body laying on the floor. And what they notice immediately is that there are things piled on top of the body. So that was really 
It's the first clue that it, this isn't something that is accidental. They contacted a detective with the Kentucky State Police. He believed that an accelerant was used and there was um, soot in his lungs, um, so he was alive. The person that would do this to an 81-year-old feeble man who had to use a wheelchair to get around and then couldn't even get up on his own is um, about the worst there is, it's about as evil as you can get. That we're able to get a forensic anthropologist and she can definitively say that Dr. Shemwell had been struck in the head with something. Dr. Shemwell suffered separate blows to his head, which meant that someone knocked him upside of the head down onto the floor, most likely, and then put things on top of him to set him on fire like he was a bonfire. I can't imagine how painful that was of a way to die. So guys, let's start with Penny Baird, who's one of our suspects. She's his wife. She's his wife and is half his age. She's 40 and he's 81. She's married to him nine months after his wife's death. Can we say at the time she married Dr. Shimwell, her financial situation was a lot different than his? Definitely, right? yes. And that's even noted in the details of the uh, prenuptial. She has nothing. Dr. Shimwell was well off and had Penny sign a prenup before they got married to keep their assets separate. But after the wedding, Penny worked real hard to get control of his money. She gets him down there and changes the trustees from his daughters to her. Then she revises Will and puts her in charge of everything. Any kind of prior criminal history? Nothing that was violent, but she has had several run-ins with the police. Before she married Frank, Penny had spent some time in jail for shoplifting. And before Frank's death, she was looking at going to prison for violating her probation. She apparently knows she's going to jail in August. We're not sure if any of this is connected with the murder, but it might suggest what kind of woman we're dealing with. OK, so let's put Chris Baird up here. Penny's son. How old was he back then? 18, 19. So if mom gets the money, he stands to benefit. Right. On the day of the murder, police brought Chris down to the station for questioning. Chris was evasive in answering the questions about where he'd been just hours earlier. The last time you were over at uh, Mr. Shimmel's house what, yesterday, you didn't see him at all today? Did you go over no. to the house today? No. No, not that right He wouldn't take a polygraph without talking to his mom. And what happens when he takes the polygraph? It was inconclusive. Were you at Dr. Shimmel's house any time before the fire started? No. Polygraphs are not a perfect science, and they are not admissible in court. But an inconclusive result will always make you wonder if Chris is maybe hiding something. Okay. All right. We do Tim. Mm -hmm. Sure. It's Penny's lover. Yep. At the time of Frank's murder, Penny was having a not very secret affair with a man named Tim Jones. I did add up here sex the morning of. He didn't say we had sex, but he insinuated. Not hiding their relationship. No. And he's his only alibi witness. He says. After she leaves, I'm home, watch Dr. Phil, or take a nap. Right. And I just happened to ease over. According to Tim, on the day of the murder, he decided to stop by Penny's house, and when he got near, the fire department trucks were already blocking his way. Not only is his story strange, but since he says he was alone, he has no one to cooperate it, and a pretty good motive to kill Frank if he wanted Penny all to himself. A key thing, too, is that Tim had these little, it's like these little racing cars that take nitromethane, which is a fast burning liquid. Well, Penny claims in one of her statements that an empty bottle of it rolled out from underneath the seat of his truck or something like right. that. She's talking about um, Tim having been the one who killed Dr. Shimwell. When questioned by police, Penny told them that Tim had admitted he killed her husband. I said, I said to him, well, I think you killed Frank. And he said, I did. And what are you going to do about it? I'll take you down with me. And we don't have him accusing her back when he hears that she's throwing him under the bus. No. Nothing. Nothing. Well, that's a pretty good start for the board. We have three suspects with potentially intersecting motives. The question is, did any of them work independently or together to kill Dr. Shemwell? We are going to meet Dr. Shimwell's grown children today. Hi. Hi. Catherine, Hi. Carolyn, and also Alan. Why don't y'all tell us about your dad? He was very smart. He had such a funny sense of humor and just, you know, a real dry way of saying things. He loved nature. On Sundays, he would always take us 
for picnics. He was incredibly strong. We'd go on a hike, and we would get too tired to continue, and he'd scoop one up with one arm, and he was take off. And his marriage with y'all's mom? They had fun together. I mean, he expressed so much distress, you know, during the time mom was dying and afterwards about being left alone. He just, he hated that. Well, when was it that y'all first realized that your dad was even considering dating Penny? I'll tell you when I first knew. Our, okay. our mother was in the hospital and she was dying. And I asked Daddy, I'm going to get some dinner. You know, would you like something? And he said, oh, don't worry about that. Penny's brought a casserole over and I have plenty of food. She was bringing him food already, you know, before our mother was even dead. And there was never a time where y'all went to confront her or individually headed out with her or anything? Oh, yeah, we did. <laughs> I was going to say, how could you, I mean, we did. how could you not? I don't know. She just had this gloating look on her face. Like, she knew it wasn't going to matter what I said, that she had this. Mm -hmm. I think that's every child's nightmare for their parent. If they marry gold digger wife number two or three, you don't like it. And you want to tell your dad, no, you can't marry her, but you can't. You can't stop them. Thank you. You have to hug me. I will. But a gold digger is not necessarily a murderer. And I can't help but think that if Frank is getting companionship and care from Penny in return for letting her spend his money, then maybe Penny didn't have a motive to kill Frank after all. Think about how old that house is. Dr. Shimla was born there and was raised there, and then he had his kids and he raised them there. Yeah. We're on our way to the house where Dr. Frank Shimwell was bludgeoned and burned to death in 2006. Oh my God, look at that place. It's a nice house. Frank's wife Penny inherited most of the assets after he died, but his children inherited the house, which they sold soon afterwards. Morning, guys. Chief. Fire Chief Steve Kyle was one of the initial responders. Okay, let's go inside and tell us what all you saw. And today he's trying to help us figure out what happened. So when you got here that day, Chief, and you came in the kitchen, what all did you see? It was immediately evident that this was the room of origin. This room had the most burn damage. Dr. Shimmel was in the fetal position with his head right where the oven and table came together. We know Dr. Shimwell was found on the floor with two fractures to his skull and a filing cabinet resting on top of his body. The question here is, how did he end up like that? OK, so I'm Dr. Shimwell, and I'm sitting here watching my TV. First thing you think the murderer does is what? We know there were two blows to the head. So if you take blow number one and hit. OK, so he's down here on the ground. All right, at some point, there's a second blow delivered. And you take this filing cabinet, and you throw it on top of him, and then the books are piled on top. <laughs> 